Well, I am thankful that you guys are here again today. Um, again, as I was saying to you offline, I don't take that for granted. You guys could be anywhere doing anything, and you have chosen to be in Bible study today. So thank you so much for being here. We are in 1 Peter, again, as we uh, continue through this walk. Uh, we're finishing up the third chapter today uh, as we look into this great passage of scripture that God has given to us. Um, when we're looking at 1 Peter, we're looking at 1 Peter, the third chapter and the 18th through the the 22nd verse. So that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, I'm hoping and praying that as we go through this, that we'll have uh, God's response uh, to us uh, as he uh, as he continues to speak to us uh, in this moment and help us to see uh, what he has for us. Now, we've received many wisdom nuggets from the Apostle Peter in this book. I, I hope that you agree with that because 1 Peter chapter 3 first talks to us about the converted wife and her responsibility to an unsaved husband. Then we look at the enormous responsibility, it's one verse, but we looked at the enormous responsibility that a saved husband has to his wife is to respect her and to understand her, to live with understanding. And then we begin to talk about our own responsibilities as Christian believers uh, and, and what that responsibility is to one another, to God, you know, in our relationship with him. And then today we're going to end up looking at chapter three and the position of Christ in our lives uh, as we look at this idea of unlocking uh, this great mystery, this great power that God has given to us and the unlocking the depths of our faith. So I hope that you'll be praying with us today. Let's pray. Father, we ask God that you would unlock this faith that we have, the depths of it, so that we'll know the depths and the heights and the width of your love, God, that we'll know, God, uh, how to live this life, even in the midst of persecution and all kinds of uh, anxieties that we might feel as Christian people today. Father, I ask that you would open up our ears that we might hear, open up our eyes that we might see, open up our hearts, God, that we might receive. And then, Father, I pray, God, that your anointing would be on this lesson, God, and that you would give us exactly what needs to be said, God, even when we are in the midst of confusion or things that seem difficult in the scripture, God, we ask that you would enlighten us in a way that you can so that we'll never be confused about your word, but Father God, we'll be transformed by it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if we turn to the book of 1 Peter 3 and verses uh, 18, through 22. I'm going to be reading from the New American uh, Standard Version if it just re refers a little differently than yours. All right. So it says, for Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 19, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Verse 20, who once were disobedient when the patient of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark and which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And last verse 22 says, who at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Amen.
So those are the verses that we're going to cover today. Um, they seem like very simple questions and very simple words, but we're going to be looking at this from the perspective that God has given to us uh, an amazing, an amazing uh, analogy and a great uh, time for us to understand what God wants to say to us in this moment. And I pray that today uh, you will see uh, his uh, grace, that you'll see his love, and that you'll see his faithfulness in all of this. And so that's what we're looking at today. So as we unlock the depths of our faith today, I want to start out by talking about this gentleman. This was a guy from the 19th century, uh, early 19th century. Um, you know, none of us were there. <laughs> and but this story uh, resonates. And I thought that this would be a good place for us to start today uh, as we look into uh, the depths of unlocking our faith. Uh, his name was Charles Blauden. He was a uh, kind of a tight war, you know, artist, a very famous one, uh, would do great feats. And one of the things that we found out about this gentleman is that he had an ability uh, to, to go into realms that no one else did. Uh, I like that because he was able to show us uh, in perpetuity how we were able to go from Canada to, uh, I'm sorry, from America to Canada by walking a tightrope. The interesting thing about this tightrope walker is that when he was walking this tightrope, he uh, was amazing. All of the people who were around him and looking at him and, and they were just in, in awe. And so he stops at a point and says, do you all believe that I can do this? And they shouted, yes, we believe that you can do this. They, they uh, had every confidence in this man that he was able to do this walk. Uh, and, and I find it odd because a whole tightrope across from Canada to America over the Niag Niagara Falls, that's a very dangerous feat. However, one of the things that when he was talking to his audience, uh, they were amazed and they were just, you know, plotted and they were like, yeah, yeah, you know, do it because this was a really daring act. So when he be prepared to step on the rope, according to those who were there, the onlookers, you know, they held their breath and they took a moment and he took a moment to address the crowd when he says, do you believe that I can successfully walk across this tightrope? And the crowd cheered, yes, yes, we believe in that. Then he said that, do you believe that I can carry a person on my back while crossing that same tightrope? Now, I know that a tightrope over the Niagara Falls going from America to Canada, that's a long way. It's hard enough for a tightrope artist, but can you imagine somebody on his back? So the crowd felt silent, unsure as to what they were going to say or what they should say about it. But there was a young man who stepped forward and he says, I believe in you. You can do it. I, I trust you completely. And the crowd gasped because they could not believe the audacity of this young man. Blondin, though, he smiled and he said, sir, will you be willing to be that person on my back? So that was a whole different thing because the young man hesitated for a moment and his faith being put to the test, he says, finally, nodded and then he climbed on to Blodden's back and every step that went along the way the crowd just watched with awe and amazement as they safely came over to the other side across the falls without falling. The incredible illustration that we see is also what we find in this passage today in unlocking our faith because God has given us as believers this incredible faith 
uh, so that we can believe in his power and trust him with our lives and to step out like that young man did in obedience. But he hesitated and so do we. But he went forth. Even though we doubt our ability to cross the challenges of trials that lie before us, our faith in God is not nearly the same in the sense that we know God's capabilities. He is better than blotted. He's more dependable than a tightrope walker. And God is asking us today, do you believe in me? If your answer is yes, Lord, then you are stepping into the unknown and we unlock our faith like this young man did on Blodden's back when we experience the joy of walking through the challenges of our lives with the guidance of our father, uh, allowing him to lead us. And so let's take a leap of faith into this passage of scripture today and hopefully we can unlock our faith together, all right? So as we look at this passage, we first of all, uh, we look at verse 18. Verse 18 basically tells us of God's love and his faithfulness toward us. He tells us in his, in his word uh, that we are his that we belong to him. And when we think about the fact that we belong to him and that we are his, we know that through this word of God, that we can depend upon it, we can trust in him, just like we trusted in him in the other verses of the passage of scripture that helps us to uncover this mystery of the faith. So back to verse 18, as we look at that, we realize that Christ, also died for sins once and for all for both the just and the unjust and let's just stop right there for a moment god died once and for all so we're we're looking at or what we have to first of all understand in unlocking our faith in christ is god's permanence and his purpose again unlocking our faith, we learn to depend upon God's permanence and also his purpose. Because first of all, God died once for all for the just and the unjust. I love that because we were not always uh, justified by faith. We were, we were sinners. And Peter is talking about Christ in this part of the Bible, he wants to show that Jesus is this perfect example of someone who suffered unfairly, but he still obeyed God. You remember the garden in which he says, God, if it, if it be possible, will you take this cup away from me? But he says, but not my will, but yours be done. So Peter mentions that Jesus died for us. Even though he was innocent, Jesus died to substitute his life for us, taking our place. We deserve to die. We deserve to be rotting in hell. But this happened once and for all. And because of his, because he was sinless, he still went to bring us a permanence where he says that regardless of what happens in life, once you've received me, you are saved. I don't know about you guys, but that's a assuring thing for me to know that Christ loves us so much, that he adores us so much, that he would die for us and permanently seal us in his promise. Oh my goodness gracious. When I think about that, I am in awe of our God and the fact that he loves us so much. So when we look at this, we look at the fact that Jesus is telling us through the apostle Peter, he's telling us that I died once for all. For those of you 
who have received him. And for those of us who are praying for those in our families, in our friends, our neighbors who will come to know Jesus Christ as well. Jesus died once and for all for the just and the unjust, saying that until he comes again, he will still offer salvation to all. I love that. And I don't know about you, but it gives me confidence in a God who knows who I am and still loves me enough to die for me. I don't know if you all feel how, how awesome that is for a God who knows us, knows us intimately, knows what we do every single day, knows what we think, Oh, that's scary. Knowing what we have done in the past, and yet God still said, I love my daughters and sons, and I died once for all for each and every one of us. And then we get to the phrase that to bring us to God means that what Jesus did, he made us have a close relationship with God. We approach him freely and confidentially knowing that we have access to grace. What does it say that we have the abundance of grace? We can come to the throne room and obtain grace and mercy and find help in our time of need. We have an open door to God's presence. We have to be available. He's always available waiting for us to have a conversation with him, waiting for us to be in his presence. And yet we don't always take advantage of that, believers. You know, when we think about it, the temple, when Jesus died, the temple veil was torn and it symbolized the way that God is now open to us through Jesus Christ. And we can come to God and we can receive his love his help whenever we need it. I love that because in this part of the by, by, uh, the part of the scripture, it's a phrase that talks about Jesus being made alive in the spirit. And we are knowing that this is not the same kind of aliveness that we see in our, uh, in terms of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when we, you look at some of the uh, Greek manuscripts that have been written, there's no capital letters in Greek. And for those of you who have studied, you all might have studied with us uh, at Salem. You may have studied in your own school, but you know that there is no capital letters in Greek manuscripts. So we can't be sure if that passage of scripture is referring to the Holy Spirit or the Spirit in general. However, Jesus our Lord had a real body. He had a real soul and a real spirit. And because God is in, uh, he was just God inside a human body. Remember that he's fully God, fully man. So we know that he was truly human as well as God. And when he died, he gave up his spirit to the father and unlikely his spirit experienced death at the point because we know that he died. That's what scripture confirms to us again and again. And we can have the confidence of that because we saw witnesses. If you look at uh, Matthew uh, account uh, at the very tomb, if you look at the accounts in Luke and John and Mark, you will see that the women as well as John actually saw him die. We also see that later on, they realized that he was put in a tomb and then he they saw him alive on that third day. So it is likely that being made alive in the spirit does not mean resurrection here. Uh, many scholars will tell you that it means that resurrection uh, because resurrection is related to our body and not our spirit, this is not the same spirit as in the Holy Spirit. So when we unlock our faith, we have to understand that we have to understand God's proclamation. We unlock the depths of our spirit when we understand God's 
proclamation because not only was he uh fully speaking to the spirits here in verse 19 it says that he went to proclaim or the proclamation to the spirit now in prison small letter spirit not holy spirit okay so first peter verses 19 this is like that complicated very complicated verse that many scholars argue about after being made alive he went into the proclamation of the imprisoned spirits and the interpretation of this verse has varying viewpoints with biblical scholars when you all look this up if you looked it up already you know that many people have different thoughts about this so let's look at it first of all preaching to the spirits some people think that jesus died on the cross but he went to a place called hades where the spirits of people had died before him he wanted to tell them about salvation and give them a chance to respond to the message that's some people's uh, uh, interpretation of this there is another interpretation descent into hell which is another idea that that jesus went to hell to tell the people there that he had won and was now free and this could include important people from the old testament who are waiting to be saved. Then there's a third version that's called symbolic interpretation. And these experts think that the verse shouldn't be taken literally, but rather in a symbol. They believe that it represents that Jesus showing his victory over sin and death to the fallen angels or the other powerful beings. Now, these are three well-known interpretations and different religious groups and different biblical scholars may have different ideas about what this verse means. This verse is complicated because it uses this powerful imagery and it's not easy for us to fit into other parts of the Bible and religious um, beliefs. But as we understand this idea, it's called systematic theology, which simply means that from the Old Testament to the New Testament, do we see consistency on one idea? And so since this passage is tricky, it suggests that Jesus went to the dead spirits and preach to them. And some believe that this means that there's a second chance to ask forgiveness after death. But we don't believe that because it's not consistent in our theological perspective. Some may say spirit mentions that it's actually the Holy Spirit, but it is not. They argue that Jesus preached through Noah and was guided by the Holy Spirit and the spirits were disobedient in Noah's time and now in prison. But when we look at this word preach and J.A. Torrey kind of gives us an understanding as is he is a biblical scholar who really helps to help us to understand that. When we look at the word preach in this verse, in the New Testament, there are two words for the word preach. One means to share the gospel, right? Because if we look at Matthew, the 28th chapter and the 18th through the 20th verse, where Jesus says, go into all the world and to preach the gospel, okay? That's one. The other word means to announce the arrival of the king or the kingdom. And in this passage, verse 19 and 20, he is talking about this second word in the Greek, meaning to announce the arrival of the king or the kingdom. That's what's suggested here because announcing the king and the kingdom, even to the spirits in prison means the spirits of people who died in sin, and there's no second chance for them. 
That's why it's so important for you and I as believers today to spread the gospel to everybody now. There is not a second chance after death. We have to be able to make sure that people know of Jesus Christ the Lord. And even if we understand the spirits in prison to mean the spirits of people who died in sin, there's no hint that there's going to be that second chance for them. But the purpose instead here is that Jesus went to announce, even in hell, that he was king and kingdom to them, and that Christ is being announced as king on heaven, on earth, and in hell. Now, when we look at the results of this preaching, we, there's no mention of spirits in prisons being converted by it. We'll see nothing that supports that idea where some people think that people were given a second chance. They're not. The purpose of this preaching is to, it was to save those who are already to loss or to proclaim the kingdom of God throughout the universe. That's not possible in this interpretation. We know that when we confess Jesus as Lord and as Savior of our life, we receive salvation. We cannot wait till the day when we are forced to acknowledge him. Remember, the scripture says that there will be a day that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that which is on the earth, which is under the earth. All of those will acknowledge him. But this is not the time in which acknowledgement brings salvation this is just acknowledging his kingdom and that he was truly king so on the cross jesus suffered and died for us he was put to death and his spirit experienced death in a physical source and so jesus made a special proclamation to the spirits in prison and so what are these spirits in prison i'm glad you asked because i had to look it up too First of all, these spirits that are in prison, we're talking about this uh, idea of what Genesis, I believe it's the first chapter and um, it's the first chapter of Genesis. I'm sorry, it's not the first chapter of Genesis. It is the 11th chapter of, of Genesis where we find that, um, that Noah, was in a situation where there was all kinds of men. They would talk about these angels that had been marrying the women on the earth. And so they began to have these children. They had these children and these were giants and giants in the land. And we understand that as being what they're talking about. These angels came who were fallen into the earth began to join themselves with human beings, but they did not trust God. They did not believe in God. And so what Jesus is doing at that point in, according to Peter's account, is going and saying, I am the Lord, the one that you didn't serve, the one that you didn't believe in, I'm proclaiming who I am, and now I'm going to arise again. So when we look about unlocking this faith, unlocking these depths of faith, we have to understand that there is no inconsistency in the scripture. Jesus proclaimed himself to them because he said that I was going to make sure that every person knows, both in the earth and under the earth, that I am the Lord. So the next thing that we realize is that we unlock the depths of our faith when we understand this remedy that God has already given to us. As we find in verses 20 and 21, he talked about once we were disobedient, you and I were disobedient. And when the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, there were eight people who were brought safely through the water, right? And then he goes in verse 21 talking about that this corresponds, this baptism, to now what saves us, not this removal of dirt from our body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. 
Now, I found that to be interesting because what he's talking about here is that salvation is the guarantee of our redemption. And the symbolism of baptism is our identification through the water baptism. First Peter uh, tells us and explains to us these first important points. First, he discusses the idea that baptism is not simply an outward act, but it's a symbol of our desire to be free from sin, a clean conscience before God. It is the prayer of forgiveness and cleansing. When you and I were baptized, we were baptized not because uh, we, it symbolized that we were just dirty and now we needed to be clean, but it also has a conscious mind where we're saying to people, I have aligned with Jesus Christ. I have made a confession toward him. For many of you all who have been married or you've been engaged, you all have rings. Those rings symbolize something. In engagement, it symbolizes that I am showing this ring on my finger to be able to represent this relationship that we're about to make in covenant. If you have a wedding band on your finger, you're saying that this covenant that we have made together, that it is unbroken before God. And that is the same thing that we're doing with baptism. He emphasized that baptism itself cannot save us, but through the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, we are saved. Jesus is now exalted. He is now exalted and powerful and superior to any of the hostile forces or powers that are in the earth. So when Peter relates these experiences of Noah and his family who are saved from the evil forces of their time, the disobedience of those who are around them at the same time, Peter encourages us as Christians to be saved and protected from the evil forces that might persecute us. Nothing in our creation can separate us from the love of God. You all remember that in Romans. There is neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor rulers of darkness nor height nor depth nor any other creature that gets to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so we know that our salvation is not based upon our baptism. Our baptism is the symbolism that I have a clear conscience that I have an authority, a representation with the Lord. For those of you who know about sororities and fraternities or even things like Eastern Star and all of that, you know that there is a time uh, in which they initiate those individuals into that organization, right? There's an initiation. If you go through a, a doctoral program, there is an initiation in which they get you into that program because they say to you at the end, you need to prove through dissertation that you are, you know, you know, that you know this information. And then if you prove your, with your dissertation that you know this information and they accept it and they ask their questions and you're able to defend it, then they say at the end, welcome Dr. So-and-so-and-so, right? They say that because now they are assured that you understand the process and that you belong. If you're part of that sorority, that fraternity, there's a point in which they initiate you and say, you are a part of this organization. We were not initiated through baptism. We were initiated through salvation. Salvation saved us. And whether or not we ever made it to the pool or not, we would be saved. But the reason why we do baptism, according to Peter, and showing us that and the importance of that is because Jesus did baptism. He did that to align with God. And we do that to align with God. So it's not complicated 
but we realized, first of all, that those prisons of the spirit were not actual people. Those were angels. They were not there to be receiving the Christ, but to also acknowledge that Christ won his victory. So Peter acknowledges and he tells us and encourages us as Christians to trust Jesus who has overcome every opposition and not to be afraid. And he reminds us of this faith that should guide our choices and how we strive to live this life. So the last thing that we have to understand to unlock the depths of our faith is we have to understand Christ's position. We have to understand Christ's position. And this is found in verse 22. It says, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. So I love this because Christ now sits at the right hand of God where he rightfully belongs. And he went to heaven and he went after those angels, right? and authorities now and powers every enemy every hellion every demon every person are subjected to him whether or not you agree with that or not we are all subjected to him and that is such a great thing for us as believers today because we know that jesus is exalted and occupies the seat of power beside god and is superior to all hostile powers the thing that encourages us about that is that we don't have to worry about the weapons of warfare. They're carnal, <laughs> but they're not mighty. But we have a God who is fighting on our behalf. And by putting on these strongholds, he's able to keep us even in the midst of persecution. He's able to keep us in the middle of sickness. He's able to keep us in the middle of hostile times. He's able to keep us when we can't keep ourselves. He is seated and exalted on the right hand of the Father. He occupies the seat of power and he is superior to all hostile powers because he loves us and he defends us and he's with us and he it continues to care for us. Thank God that we have the power of God that sits on the seat of power, that regardless of what hostility we go through in life, whether or not on the job, whether or not in a marriage, whether or not anywhere that we go, we have God who was looking out for us. And like Blondin, who was walking that tightrope, asking, do you believe that I can do this? Jesus is asking us every day, do you believe that God can do what he said he would do in his word for us? Does you believe that? And that, that doesn't mean that sometimes when you doubt that you don't believe it, but Sometimes you have to have in your heart the peace of God that says, God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief, God. I need to trust you. I need to trust you. I want to step out on faith. I want to believe that you are who you say you are. And so let's take a leap of faith today, knowing that God is more capable of carrying us through these trials, these tribulations of life, that we can trust him completely and that there is no limit to what he can do for us and through us. Thank God for the word of God that continues to encourage our heart and that we don't have to passively rely on our own journey. Thank the Lord, because we are incapable of doing some things on our own, but we can rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of our lives and dwells within us. And so even though this is a hard passage for us to understand, and there's a lot of ideas that theologians have, we have the confidence of knowing that God has given us that chance. And now that we belong to him, 
we have power because he said, greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Come on, let's unlock our faith today. Let's unlock the depths of our faith today. Let's go on and trust God for being who he is. He's on the right hand of the father. He's in the seat of power and he is fighting for us. Father, I thank you so much, God, for your word today, God. I ask, God, that you would continue to help us, God, to realize that we can unlock our faith, God, through these areas of understanding your permanence and your purpose in our life, God. Help us to understand, Lord God, that you are the God who is able to open up our minds and understand that our baptism is not what saves us. It's not the cleansing that cleanses us. We're already cleansed through your power and your mercy through receiving you as Jesus Christ and asking you to be Lord of our lives. But because we belong to you, we become baptized as an alliance, as a symbol, as a representation that we are in your camp, God. But thank you, God, that even when you showed your authority in hell, even when you spoke to those fallen angels, God, you proved even in the grave that you were truly the Lord, the King and the kingdom to come. And Father God, I thank you for that representation. And I thank you more than anything else that today we can rely upon you because you still sit on the hand of the Father. You still sit in power. You still sit in authority. And you said no weapon that comes against us will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us will be brought it down in judgment because this is the heritage of the children of God. So thank you for all of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining us today. Next week, we're going to start with the fourth chapter of First Peter. I hope that some of this was cleared up for you. I know that theologians have been all over the place, but you study for yourself because that's what Bereans did. They heard the word and then they searched the scriptures to say what was so. So be blessed today. We're going to go into our discussion now with our Bible study with some of the questions that we have, and we hope to see you on next week. God bless you. Thank you for uh, joining us with a word for the journey. Thank you.